who I am, what are my ethnic roots, and which geographical region do I identify with? These are questions we all ask ourselves from time to time. And if you think to yourself, I am European, or more precisely, I come from Eastern Europe, then this conversation you are about to listen to will be certainly important for you. Because today I am talking with the author of the newest book about Eastern Europe, Katarzyna Murawska Mutezius. Hello, Kasia. Thank you for joining me on this channel. A very interesting publication has appeared recently on the literary market. It calls Imaging and Mapping Eastern Europe. And this is your book, Kasia. So my first question to you is, um, why did you decide to write a book about Eastern Europe? Because we know that nowadays there are a plenty of uh, books, a plenty of publications about this subject. First, I want to say thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very pleased that I can talk to you. And I'm very pleased that you are interested in the book. And what I have to start from is, is from saying that actually the book was brewing for a very, very long time. And my idea came to me very long time. I actually should not even admit that, but it did. <laughs> but I have to say, it. when I moved from, in, from Poland to England, uh, that was... Mm, that was 1990, so very, very long time mm -hmm. ago. And the press was full of news from Eastern Europe, which just arrived from behind the Berlin Wall. Yeah. So that was a really a very hot topic. And surely I was reading all that. Larry Wolf's book, um, which is quoted very often in actually any book on Eastern Europe, his book was called Inventing Eastern Europe and was based mostly on travel diaries of 18th century travelers through mm -hmm. Europe, including the region. That that triggered um, the interest in the construction of Eastern Europe as an entity. And it was followed by many other books, which must have been already prepared for a long time, such as uh, Maria Todorova books on the imaging, actually, no, imagining the, ba the Balkans, yeah. or um, Vesna Goldsworthy um, on novels, on mm -hmm. inventing Ruritania. Um, so, again, inventing was the issue. So, but the visual production of Eastern Europe was completely, was, um, did not attract um, attention. So that was an ideal topic for me. I've been just, um, you know, thinking how to reinvent myself from the curator of um, uh, Italian painting into mm -hmm. a kind of more... Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a scholar who covers many other disciplines. So that was simply a topic for me. How long did you write this book? Well, no, I was writing many articles and then I decided yeah. in, in, actually it was my, after my return from, uh, from a stay in Poland um, as a deputy director of the National mm -hmm. Museum, then I thought actually it is time to finish it, to, to, to publish, mm -hmm. to assemble the text that I have written so far and to turn it into a book. You decided to present uh, Eastern Europe uh, from iconological point of view. How did you, did you choose the cartoons, the photographs? Uh, how did you collect them? Why have I focused on images? Because there was not enough focus on images. This is, of course, the result of linguistic imperialism. Mm -hmm. That, that, that knowledge is produced by text, um, you know, in that, that 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 you um, that cognition is solely textual uh, mm -hmm. rather than visual. At the time when I arrived in England, I also um, was become very interested, and I even did my second MA in visual culture. Mm -hmm. So it is the visual culture's premises mm -hmm. that. Um, the concept of the pictorial turn that the mm -hmm. images are, they have to be studied from a different, from various perspectives. The new yeah. iconology, which was proposed by W.J.T. Mitchell, which um, actually he took some issues with Panofsky's iconology, but I, I will return to that. But he coined the term, the pictorial turn, that we have to focus on images and to study them from, you know, from a, mm -hmm. as many mm, mm, angles as possible. But of course, from socio-political perspectives, 
mostly. Mm-hmm. Um, then focus on all kinds of images, not just not just mainstream art, but yeah. mainstream art belongs to a much wider sphere of visual culture, of media imagery, of scientific imagery, map making, for instance. So it is visual Mm -hmm. culture which in a way inspired me and because I was studying it and I thought that yes, this is what I have to do. Maps uh, were being produced at the time when I I started my research. Many new maps on Eastern Europe and many... (laughs) So I followed those maps in in the media, in, in, in newspapers. Iconology was something, was the method um, in art history that I was brought up uh, on. My mm-hmm. supervisor was Jan Białostocki, who was fantastic, you know, a wonderful person I will never forget. And I learned iconology from him. And um, iconology for me was the best method to... Um, to adopt or some premises of iconology because iconology studies images in the long durée, you know, and mm-hmm. eventually, although I did want to focus on the 20th century, but once I delved into the area of map and travel um, Im- imagery, then it turned out that it is impossible because nobody mm-hmm. wrote, a, wrote a similar book about. <laughs> exactly, your book is innovative because um, we can see, we can understand a whole culture of Eastern Europe, what was not very obvious. We just read publications about this political context, about uh, Yalta, about a uh, post-communistic bloc, and you describes us, you shows us these uh, times w- before. I'm very happy that you are saying that. Yes, it is about the history of the region. History of the region before it was named as the region, because the term Eastern Europe is a very old term. Of course, there would be um, you know, German scholars who, who proved that they were the users of the term in the 18th century. And you know, I myself found some maps of Eastern Europe made in the 19th century, but they covered completely different territories. So really the term Eastern Europe became um, um, widely known and became you know, used uh, both by academia and in the in everyday language uh, after the Second World War, during the Cold War. But images of Eastern Europe had existed before the term was coined. You use the uh, term slaka in your book. And this is uh, also um, not very famous term, I would say, when we are talking about this region. Um, what does it actually mean? Yes, that's right. Um, the slaka, um, there, there's a book written by Malcolm Bradbury, the British author who actually lived in Norwich in the place where, where I'm based in, 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 in England. Uh, and he was teaching at the University of East Anglia. So uh, Malcolm Bradbury wrote a novel um, uh, uh, who was very much praised when it was published in um, in the early 1980s. Um, and it was called Rates of Exchange. And it, in it, he invented a fictitious country, which was called Slaka. Um, and that was an amalgam of various Eastern mm-hmm. European countries. He wrote a very important sentence about Eastern Europe, that this is a region who exists and doesn't exist. Can we find some kind of uh, similarities um, um, between Poland, between um, uh, Bulgaria, Hungary, and uh, former Czechoslovakia? Malcolm Bradbury identified some of them, and that was this instability, yeah. unbelongingness, um, peasant culture, impossibility, a kind of lack of, um, um, mm. I mean, inability to speak a proper English. We will all speak proper English, but but those people from Slaka, they will always mispronounce English. And while he presented himself as a person, I mean, he, he presented himself as a linguist, but mm-hmm. obviously as a person who can actually master Slakan language. Yeah. So this kind of inferiority of Slakan, of people from Slaka who can never adopt Western idiom. His book mm-hmm. um, is based on his research. He must have read many histories and he mm-hmm. identified those 
tropes, those kind of narrative tropes, which appear in academic um, history books that claim that um, Eastern Europe, um, um, that the fate of Eastern Europe is determined by its position on the map of Europe. Yes, that's right. That's the point, yes. because I would say that this is very important nowadays, just to understand that uh, that Eastern Europe uh, has to be uh, treated um, the same as the West Europe was treated for a, a long time. Your book uh, just show us that we sh shouldn't be ashamed anymore of being uh, East Europeans. Yes, that's right. This is actually the title of an article which I uh, through which I found a book with, which I um, um, through which I found. Uh, an image for the cover. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Uh, we should not. Um, we should not be ashamed of be of being Eastern European or something like that. Very mm -hmm. similar to what you have said. And um, I found this. Um, that was an interview with Katarzyna Perlak, who is a who is a Polish uh, artist of. I mean, the artist of Polish origins who who studied in England and who lives in England. I saw it. I thought this is the cover for my book. They sing songs about love while changing the gender of mm -hmm. of the lover. So they. Um, the old songs about um, heterosexual love are yeah. changed into songs um, about um, um, homoerotic love. This, this is hugely interesting and it shows that the ethnic dress can be used um, um, in order to fight for, for, um, for human rights, um, for, um, for the rights for, for people, for everyone, regardless of their ethnicity of their, or their sexual or, um, orientation. But the masks on their faces um, point that there is something wrong, <laughs> that they are not just, um, uh, that this is counterfolk, not just the ordinary. Yeah, they cannot show their faces. Uh, that's also this is the story behind that. Yes, I know from the artist, mm -hmm. from uh, that uh, that the singers didn't want to show their faces, but eventually the 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 um, the message uh, sent by the mask is this message of warning. It mm -hmm. it is a sign of resistance mm -hmm. um, rather than fear. You know. Mm -hmm. That might have been um, uh, might have come from the fear of those singers, but eventually it turned into the message of resistance. So um, I mean, it is my major thing that the images keep changing, um, that the one at the same image can be invested with various meanings. That we have to look closely at images and use them in order to fight fight for equality. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, your book is divided into five main sections. Which part was particularly laborious? All of them were laborious. You know, this is, um, and um, you know, maps. I've been studying them for a long time, but then once I decided I have to go back to the past, then it was quite a quite a, and it gave in a way the recipe how to um, translate um, the spherical globe into mm -hmm. the um, into the um, two dimensional uh, space um, of the of the map mm -hmm. on the paper uh, yeah. and uh, he also described the whole globe. the maps have not survived mm -hmm. and they were only known in in copies so that was a huge challenge for humanists uh, to mm -hmm. to actually to to respond to his recipes how mm -hmm. to how to map the world. There were many other maps of Sarmatia Europa, which cover the territory of today's Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And they were all, um, most of them were connected to Europe. They, went, they did not feature as a different region, but they were drawn on the, those horizontal maps of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so they adopted a completely different approach, you know, the cartographical approach. Sarmatia was not, was not detached. And then the, um, uh, came, the, then you may say that Eastern Europe start, 
stopped existed, <laughs> existing, mm. you know, because those many of those regions were occupied by other countries. But uh, the 20th century, that is after the peace conference in, in Versailles, when the region was reconstructed anew, mm -hmm. and it arrived again under, under hundreds of names, not necessarily Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe was not, was not the first one. Mm -hmm. And then, um, other maps were being produced, a new cartographic formula, which was vertical, mm -hmm. uh, which presented those countries as squeezed within the vertical map, mm -hmm. very uncomfortable, uncomfortably, very often completely detached from the continent. So there was no Western Europe, neither was, was there Russia. So this move from the mm -hmm. horizontal formula onto the vertical formula suggest this unbelongingness, um, instability, and it dominated the cartographic gaze through the 20th century. It still dominates today. I often see that this belief and a kind of question mark on people's faces when I talk about it, because mm -hmm. people, of course, we know that Eastern Europe is this, because we know it from the maps that Eastern mm -hmm. Europe is this region where um, the countries are positioned on top of each other. But mm -hmm. this is a hugely important, um, uh, important realization that it is the cartography which imposed this perception on us that once you represent Eastern Europe as a part of the larger of the larger Europe, of the larger world, it doesn't look like this in-between strip. Yeah. It, is the, it is the effect of the cartography that we think about Europe, Eastern mm -hmm. Europe, as something in-between, as something not belonging anywhere. Yes. It can be put on Alaska, anywhere. It is a floating um, part of Europe. Uh, the mo most fun was writing about travel imagery, um, about uh, mm -hmm. um, National Geographic, because I did a um, huge study of the um, images of Eastern Europe in National Geographic. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm going to proceed it by a short introduction of, um, you know, those visual tropes that mm -hmm. other people must have been written about it, or other people must have been written at least about traveling to Eastern Europe. And then I found a huge gap. There is nothing like that. I thought I would go to the library and I will spend, you know, maybe two weeks in the library and I will arrive with, with a good material for my, for the preface to this chapter, a, a chapter uh -huh. about National Geographic. And no, I had to start everything anew. So that was very, but that was quite, that took me quite a long time. It was fantastic to look at the images with a very totally unprejudiced um, eye. I mean, of course, I was slightly prejudiced by what I found in National Geographic, but um, I did find out and um, that really it is the ethnic dress which dominates, which has dominated the represent travel imagery to Eastern Europe from the very beginning. Okay. And um, so this is something new. And um, I, I mean, this is something that we don't want to deny as Eastern Europeans. Mm -hmm. We don't want to deny that Eastern Europe, that we are characterized by the ethnic dress. And mm -hmm. again, you know, kudos to, um, to Kasia Perlak, who mm -hmm. actually had the, um, you know, had, had this courage and she, to, to, to point out to the importance yeah. of the ethnic dress. Yeah. For, um, when you talk about us as uh, Eastern Europeans, because you and me, we are emigrants, but we are also from Poland. Can we say um, that we are satisfying with being from Eastern Europe according to the, the political also situation which, um, which we have today? Oh, that's a very difficult question. Uh, you know, that it depends on who, on who we are. Mm, I would always <laughs> stress that I'm from Poland and I'm from Eastern Europe, but I guess that not 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 all people would like to acknowledge that. You know, there. I mean, Eastern Europe has been divided into uh, those fractional into those mm -hmm. fractions. There are the Baltic countries, which which drift their own way very much. Mm -hmm. uh, the Balkan countries, which uh, got the strength from the very derogatory perception of the mm -hmm. Balkans for a long time. You know, they turned it into their strengths. Yeah, they are. Visegrad countries, which are the most mm -hmm. problematic in that. Yeah. I would say that um, Eastern Europe is still very divided uh, today, um, but um, I would say that your book um, helps us um, to unify, <laughs> 
just to find uh, these uh, similarities uh, of culture or these uh, points of view, uh, which can um, just be a, a unit uh, for us. No, I'm very happy that you are saying that, you know, that would be if, if, <laughs> if I would be most happy, if really, that would, um, my book would act as a kind of common denominator, providing the common denominator, which, which exists in, in between countries of the region. At the same time, I'm very much aware that, you know, those, um, um, I mean, the, that everything is in the flux and Eastern Europe now finds um, similarities also with other parts of the world, the mm -hmm. world. This, this kind of essential in-betweenness, this floating character of Eastern Europe mm -hmm. um, links us to the global south, the global east. So, um, and we kind of recover our identity by finding affinities with mm -hmm. um, with, the, with resistance in South America um, or even India. And there are many books about that. So I find that interesting. And I, I, I feel that um, we will be going into that direction and including the art history field following Piotr Piotrowski, you know, um, our common yeah. friend and um, collaborator and, um, you know, the, his call for the horizontal art history, which in a way includes that, um, that believe that Eastern European art history will, uh, will gain from liaising uh, with global in, in other peripheral parts of the world. I would like to thank you uh, once again, Kasia, for this interview. Thank you so much, Kasia. That was a, a huge pleasure to talk to you about, about the book. And for all of you, for all of uh, the readers who would like to buy this book, Please see the link below. Enjoy.